Thanks. Be nice. Thanks. Harry, I'm really, really glad to be here, and um, I'm especially happy because um, because I don't get a chance to see Manolo as much as I would like since we moved to New York. So, um, so it's always a treat and a joy. And um, and I think basically, uh, well, just very briefly, when I, I met uh, Manolo. I can't even remember now, six or seven years ago, I guess, at UC Riverside, he came to give a talk at the invitation of our, our mutual friend, um, Pickles Camacho, Angelica Camacho, who uh, teaches here now at San Francisco State. I don't know if she made it here today, but um, basically, for me, it was a kind of a, there's, you know, six or seven moments in, in my life where I remember feeling like everything kind of, maybe maybe there's one part of the feeling is that everything changed and then another part of the feeling is that it didn't so much that everything changed, but that stuff became more clear. Um, the, the stuff I, just became more clear. And one of those moments was when I heard Malolo utter the phrase, renew our habits of assembly and the necessity of that. Um, and so really today, I think how I hope we proceed is, is with you, Manolo, giving us some ideas about how to do that, like, but also just give us a sense of the, the sort of practical work and protocols that, that you have been engaged in over many years in, in the interest of renewing our habits of assembly and then in thinking about what the relationship is between our capacity to renew our habits of assembly and our capacity to, our capacity for the general strike or for the taking back of space, um, for our capacity to prepare for, um, for the, for the, for what Cedric Robinson used to call the heightening of the contradictions. <laughs> so. uh, well, <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Dina and Perry and everybody with the lab for making this possible and to be here with my dear friend. And uh, to be honest with you, I just want to ask you about fugitivity. <laughs> and how fugitivity is essential to conviviality. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, in all seriousness, it is like an incredible right to, you know, have some of our friend's stature. And, and I don't mean like his, his uh, academic one of these, but the kind of work he's been doing with Stefano and other folks that he always engages in kind of serious ways. That's a little honor, of course, and it's a little intimidating, let me be honest. Um, I, I, I mean, some of us have been kind of following Fred uh, for a while, and of course, following him here during his visit and attending all these spaces, and it's just incredible to be reminded of you know, his erudition and his generosity. And, but I was thinking about this on Thursday, of his, of his kind of, of his fierceness. I mean, he's such a gentle guy, and such a thoughtful, caring person, but I think there's a fierceness there. And it's that, that kind of fierceness around critique, right? And, and the necessity for critique and the necessity to kind of engage and keep fighting. And, and I think that's what fuels the erudition, right? In other words, it's not just an academic exercise. It's, it's the hard work that we have to do. And one thing we've been thinking about kind of along these lines at CCR, the Center for Computer Research and Autonomy, which is kind of what Fred was referring to. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to get that out of the way and thank everybody. So, but to get back to, to the question, to really the seriousness about fugitivity. So the Center for Convivial Research and Autonomy is a kind of a collective that emerged out of years of Zapatismo and trying to engage this question of Zapatismo and, and Ani Paradise is here, she's also part of that collective as are others, folks in the, uh, out of the Yucatan, and of course Fred's been part of, the, part of our conversation and supporting our work and, and walking with us, you know, Preguntando Caminando. And we're trying, to, you know, think through this 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 question of CCRA and trying to try to engage this question about conviviality 
in, in this precisely what he said, you know, re reclaiming the habits of assembly as a kind of a, a pristine moment of conviviality. And, and uh, what we're trying to think through now, just to give you a little background. So again, we came out of years of Zapatismo and trying to, you know, engage the Zapatistas and try to think beyond solidarity, which of course meant, you know, how we were engaging, you know, capital, the state, um, and you know, reclaiming spaces, reclaiming institutions, and, and you know, to try to, like uh, uh, Anna Dinnerstein has been writing lately, trying to, uh, uh, you know, demediate ourselves, right? If capitalism is, is a social mediating system, that's total, then how do we demediate ourselves? In other words, we don't only want to decommodify and deprivatize and deterritorialize. We have to kind of think about how to be outside, the, the outside of the system. So we've been thinking about that and in, on a practical level, uh, you know, kind of engaging that work has meant thinking about war and violence, and we were just talking earlier, the privatization of, of violence and the privatization of fear. So I, I can talk later about like, what that looks on the, like on the ground, you know, confronting the mega projects and extractivism in, in Mexico and here, um, but also thinking of the different kinds of militarized police violence, the narco violence, and, and how it's all, of course, intertwined and linked and fundamental to capital, right? The, the, you know, like the corruption is not new. You don't have corruption without criminalization. I'm, I'm sorry, you don't have capital without corruption and without criminalization. And this is a long-standing pro process. And, and of course, race. This is our, our interrogation on race. And Cedric Robinson was an early point of reference um, for that. Also, a fierce critic, right? I mean, the argument we make this point that you know, he's fighting this out of So. You know, so on the, on the practical level, it's just it's actually confronting this level of I mean, this tense violence that confronts us on an everyday basis, and then you know trying to break down that violence, structural violence, symbolic violence, everyday violence, lived violence, violence that survived, right, collective violence, uh, etc. And, and I, I mention that because that that's kind of part of what we're trying to trying to get at that we. We can't take for granted any concept. We can't take for, for granted any, any already existing conceptualization in our process. We, in, in kind of, as, so we, bless you, as, we, as we're engaging kind of that, that violence, <coughs> bless you, and you know, what we're also trying to do is think, I think now, and I, I had some clarity listening to Fred on Thursday, <laughs> With, we're, we're actually trying to think our way beyond critique and, and then try to engage a different level of, a different kind of conceptualization. Um, and where that conceptualization then is trying to think through conviviality as conceptualized conviviality somewhat similar in a way that like Foucault was thinking about power. That it's something that we always have to be thinking about and it's not this thing, it's, it's not this entity that's out there, it's not a zero-sum moment, it's not a zero-sum game, it's not a, a zero-sum entity, it's not something that you can accumulate and claim, it, it's, it's something you exercise, right? So then the question became, or the question has become for us, been, you know, kind of thinking through tools, so for us, conviviality, and I can say, I can say more, but just kind of trying to be brief here, <laughs> I have a lot to spit out, but the idea is to think through tools and not to be glib about tools. I mean, everybody, a nonprofit talks about tools, but to think about you know, the, distinction, the distinction between conceptual tools and then convivial tools. What are, what are these actual convivial tools? Like assembly. But I think when we were in the Escuelita, again, you know, this is Preguntando Caminando with the Zapatistas since 94. But we were in the Escuelita, and the Zapatistas kind of really made it clear in the, the kind of the school that they constructed that the that the that the assembly the, the, the assembly doesn't function without work, and work can't be reclaimed 
without making a distinction between work and labor. But again, the point isn't to get so much caught up in what brand of Marxism we need to read labor and commodity and value and accumulation, and et cetera, but to think about, well, what is that moment where abstraction works in a way that it um, takes us away from work and forces us you know, to, 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 it imposes this set of disciplines and systems, and we've been talking about different kinds of dispositifs that kind of organize that moment, so we, 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 lose, we lose any connection with work, and we lose the, the conceptualization of work, and we're so, so totally, um, you know, privatized, commodified, and all this bit, right? And, but the point was, more importantly, that it, it's work that sustains the assembly in the sense that then that assembly is organized around the, the idea of determining collectively what's the work necessary to regenerate the community. The cargo, the tequio, the faena, the fiesta. So, so even, the, even the community, the, you know, frequent community parties and social events are precisely designed to re reignite, to reaffirm, uh, to, to you know, affirm the community and, and one's sense of community beyond any kind of individual sense of, of you know, Western self. Anyway, I mean, I can say more about all of that, but that's, that's kind of partly what we're trying to think through. What, what's the conceptualization? Or can we claim conviviality in terms of uh, a, a, its own conceptualization? So what we're thinking, and I, I, this is kind of a clear moment of clarity, so I, you'll forgive me because I'm just eager to ask this kind of question. Because the, the idea is, um, then, you know, the, the West imposed history and the West imposed theory, right? E even Marxist theory, right? Liberal theory, West, uh, and Marxist theory, and post-structuralist theory, all that theory. It, it was similar to history, the West imposes that to help facilitate that imposition of that social mediated system. And it, for us, one of our big questions to try to understand what, what uh, decomposes our, what, what, not decomposes, but what, what, what is, um, what is a kind of, how is the attack against our conviviality, right, the, the kind of beating away against our conviviality, how is it organized? And for us, one way, this is the only way, but for us, what we're really thinking about lately is, it's organized around war. And the West claimed war in a very particular way, much the way it claimed history, the way, much the way it claimed theory. That, for me, that, uh, that's how criminals say, well, for us, that was not to me, but I was saying to But uh, for us, that's how we think through cr criminalization and criminality. But I, 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 I have to talk about the dialect your essay and the public and terminologies. But it resonated with what we're trying to think through around. around War. And, and that's why when we were talking about, well, what should we do today, I had mentioned, well, we should talk about Du Bois' democratic despotism, notion of democratic despotism. Of course, Fred is, the, I mean, he's the man I'm with Du Bois. I'm going you know, to barely understand, you know, get into Du Bois. But, but um, there, there's a lot to be said about Du Bois, and there's a lot of contradictions around Du Bois. But uh, his notion of his, his, this is what we're also kind of thinking of around kind of convivial research and research and learning. Whatever Du Bois is about and his contradictions and how he navigated the brutality that he had to confront as a, as a you know, black, part of the black radical, you know, one of the early kind of part, uh, progenitors of the black radical tradition, democratic despotism is a brilliant concept and a brilliant category because it exposes fully how the West appropriated war and, and claimed war a, as a way to facilitate the imposition of capital. And part of the argument that he makes is that the, the, the very agreement that the white, quote unquote, working class, but in other words, 
that worker who can claim whiteness, which, which is everybody that's not, that everybody who's refused, who's not refusing it, right? Uh, that they, they, they claim it and um, are able to enjoy the benefits of the exploitation and brutalization and criminalization of black and brown bodies. And they, and they, they do that through an armed national organization, which is the, the bourgeois state, right? The, the, the later state, not the early state, but the, the, that comes to kind of fully into formation in the 19th century the manifest destiny state, right? The, the total separate colonial state. And I think that's, that's it. We need to be talking about democratic despotism, um, I think, in, in more than we, than we have. Especially with the, the spectacle and the you know, individuation that's happening right now with the elections and bullshit that's happening. It's nightmarish. But anyway. No, I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm excited too. So now, okay, this brings me, okay, so there's so much stuff that, um, that, that we have to, to, to get to. So first of all, with regard to Du Bois, um, I'm not the man, I'm not even close to being the man. I, I know who the man is though. Um, his name is Nahum Dimitri Chandler. He teaches at the University of California, Irvine. And he's the most sort of thorough and meticulous um, reader of Du Bois in the world, I think. At least the most of the one that I, he's the, the baddest one that I know. And the reason I'm bringing him up is because what you just said, Manolo, made me realize something that is really at the heart of, which is to say at the heart, but also at the very beginning of, of Nahum's project of reading Du Bois. And he, uh, Nahum wrote a book that was published, I don't know, um, I guess five or six years ago, maybe a little longer now, and it's called X. Um, is the t main title and the subtitle is The Problem of the Negro as a Problem for Thought. And the first sentence of this text, if I'm not mistaken, I hope I don't get it wrong, is we must desediment the dissimulation of a war. And that's what you're talking about. The other key, well, moment that's similar and is something that that our mutual friend Stefano Harney always was fixated on in the way that he was reading Foucault and the way that he was, and look, this is not going to be one of these things where we just start mentioning names of a whole bunch of books that y'all supposed to read. That's, it's just, we're just trying to get started. So don't, 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 don't panic, okay? Um, but, but Foucault talks about what he calls conquest denial, okay? And all this stuff has become so vivid to me over the last month because I was lucky enough, first of all, to, I was lucky about, I got invited through, you know, somewhat evil auspices to go to Columbia last month. And then I got invited through somewhat, you know, nefarious, you know, <laughs> institutional structures to, to come here. And it was almost as if I needed to come here in order to be able to talk about, to begin to try to process what happened when I went to Columbia. And um, first of all, I needed to begin to understand, but, it, but it's a process that, man, I had to give this talk. See, it's just funny. It's, my grandmother would say that the Lord works in mysterious ways, and I wish I could believe it like she did, cause, but I don't quite, but still, it's <laughs> close. Um, through the, the beautiful, non-nefarious auspices of Manolo and, and Ani and some others, Stefano and I went to Oaxaca a couple summers ago, and I, I think what happened is that I began to see 
in a much more clear way um, that, um, what's the word I want to say? I don't, how can I put it? I'm a, I want to say it even though I don't like these terms, but y'all will understand what I mean when I say that 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 I am, you know, I I have I've begun to discover that I am that I am Latin American. Okay. That that it is just not possible. It can't look the, of course I, I understand the critique of so-called American exceptionalism. And I've understood the, the necessary critiques of the African American variant of American exceptionalism. But I also understand the, the easy, equally nationalistic ways in which people can deploy that critique to bash whoever they want to bash. And I don't want to be in that fight. I, I, you know, I, you know, American descendants of slave, I don't, I don't know what this means. I, it's stupid, it's retrograde. But I also know that a whole lot of the people who are desperately you know, happy to be able to say how retrograde that is are also themselves speaking from a retrograde place. So I don't, that's not, I'm not trying to just dog. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that then there's a, so there's one understanding of yes, I, I am part of a, of a diaspora, I am part of a, massive history of displacement that manifested itself all over the course of all over this hemisphere and I recognize that but then there's this other deeper way okay than, than just where it's not about your personal identity okay anyway I'm blabbing let me let me try to make some sense I began to understand this going to Oaxaca um, and then going to Columbia just reinforced it. I began to understand, I think that, that if there is a common history of the people who have been displaced by Western modernity, the folks who were literally extracted as resources from Africa and dispersed all over this hemisphere, the people who were already here living in this hemisphere and who were dispersed and violently displaced by settlement, if what if this, the common what if the common history that we share tends towards the general strike? So that's the question that I've been thinking about, and the reason I was thinking about it was because of the way in which when we were in Oaxaca, we were kind of living through the trace and the remains of the 2006 general strike, and how that reshaped the city. And then I was reminded of that by this young woman named Pamela, whose last name I didn't even get, at the Otis College of Art, who wrote this beautiful little two-page essay on her own displacement from Oaxaca City by that, within, after the, in the aftermath of that general strike. How that, how her and her family having to leave to go to Baltimore, Maryland, right? That, that the city became unreal for her, you know, in a certain kind of way as a function of that. Um, which is to say, as a function of the paramilitary response to the general strike. And then, but that was against the backdrop of having met this woman in Bogota named Diana Sanchez, who is a kind of, I would almost call her like a meta-activist. The form her activism takes is to try to protect other activists, particularly outside of the city of Bogota, who are under the constant threat and constant duress of what she calls paramilitarism. As a kind, and she talks about paramilitarism as if it were an atmospheric condition. The way she talks about paramilitarism is kind of like the way Christina Sharp talks about anti-blackness as the weather. What if we understand that the history of our sojourn in the Americas over the last 500 years is a history of trying to survive the heavy, brutal weather of paramilitarism. And it's a paramilitarism that manifests itself in quite severe and sharp and particular ways in Mexico, 
in the Dominican Republic, in Puerto Rico, in Guatemala. But one of the things that I think it's possible to say is one of the high points of the development of this nefarious mode of paramilitarism begins in the 19th century in the United States, in the southern United States, and where what one might say the, the original gangsters of the Death Squad formation is the Ku Klux Klan. And that's a paramilitary, which is to say, so when we talk, we can talk about death squads, you know, liberal bullshitters, you know, in the United States, or Jimmy Carter could decry paramilitarism in, in the form of the death squads in El Salvador, but that shit began, well, I don't even want to say it began here, but it, but it moved through here, right? And it maintains and persists itself here, right? We could offer criticisms and we could also at the same time necessarily offer allegiance to the, the idea and the movement called Black Lives Matter. But it's important to understand that Black Lives Matter is a response to paramilitarism. Okay. It moves by way of the police here. Maybe in Colombia it's the army, but it's always also a public-private partnership. And the point is, it's an extension of conquest. It is the ongoing 500-year war of conquest that we are living, and that's okay. And that's the war whose dissimulation has to be desedimented. That's what Nahum means when he said, "I think." When he says, "Look, they've been perpetrating a war and acting like it's not one," and we have to desediment their dissimulation of this war. They're lying. They, they're prosecuting a war and calling it democracy. That's part of what, I think that's what Du Bois means by democratic despotism. Okay. So we are at war. We have existed in a state of war. Okay. And it is a war of conquest. And it is a war of conquest that is a function of extraction. And it is a war of conquest that maintains itself in the interest of continuing extraction. Okay. Again, as a black man in this hemisphere, I am the descendants of the extracted. Okay. As if we were so many tons of ore, right? Extracted in order to do the labor of extracting. Okay. Now, Okay, so that's that point. But now, we, I want you to talk more about this distinction between work and labor. Because I think, again, it's, it's, it feels like something is about to get clarified. <laughs> well, no, no, it's good to hear, it's good to hear about the question about war. I, I, I would just add that, like, the, but the Texas Rangers, <clears throat> yeah. the California Rangers, and, you know, for the folks who may be unfamiliar with the Texas Rangers and the California Rangers, they were orga organized to basically as a paramilitary outfit in, uh, in the 1820s, 1830s, in, first in Texas and then later here in, in California, essentially to, to um, hunt down indigenous peoples. And as later, at, Mexicanos, they were Mexican peoples, ethnic Mexican peoples, and they were very good at it. And they, I think they did uh, two things: one, they be, were able to manage their professionalization, mm -hmm. and two, they were they were able to write their history. They were able to write the, the they wrote their history about themselves that will become the frontier fantasy that uh, you know will kind of dominate our, our own kind of narrative of the U.S. Um, but I mean, I, I mentioned that. Uh, because I think there's a lot to talk, talk about there in terms of how war is manipulated. Mm -hmm. But also, what will happen in the in the mid-19th mid century here in California and then also in, in Texas is the members of the ethnic Mexican community will will actually have a, have a, they have their own history as Texas Rangers that gets erased. So there were Mexicans who were Texas Rangers, and, there were, and that, their participations are race. And so they're both the victims of the Texas Rangers, but they, they are at times also Texas Rangers. 
And the Texas Rangers learned how to be Texas Rangers from Mexicans. And, it, and it's a certain kind of Mexican that is attacking indigenous peoples. And, and so I say that, I say all kinds of caveats and footnotes and, and air quotes and stuff. But, but, what, but what, what's important also is that, that what they're attacking is indigenous peoples negotiating capitalism quite well, actually. In other words, they're, they're engaging capitalism at, apart from it, but they're, and have their own kind of autonomous system, but they're still able to engage it. At the same time, they're also being enslaved, and that, their enslavement is also uh, written out of, out of our history. So they, they are also become that, they are also extracted to become extractors. And so, there's a lot to talk about there. There's a complex, complex history. I'd say that to kind of preface that, that it makes it all that more complicated for us to engage indigenous autonomy currently. Uh, you know, in other words, thinking of a Zapatismo, for example, is kind of a kind of very exciting articulation of indigenous autonomy. And that's why we were in Oaxaca to kind of learn together and, and learn from that moment of general, the general strike and what this autonomy is all about what is this creative kind of long-standing over 500 year resistance around indigenous autonomy and of course we can't we cannot escape that history of the complicities and the, the complexities are so like I'm, I'm Mexican but I'm very light-skinned for example <laughs> you know that causes all kinds of complications so when you know when Du Bois talks about kind of how, how war becomes the site of deception, it, it's nationhood, right? The raza cosmica as a dispositif that helps organize that. So Mexico in many ways is at the forefront of a lot of what Du Bois is talking about. The United States is following. Of course, they'll catch up with a vengeance. And, and the, 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 persecuted, the, the persecution and the, the internecine violence of Mexico I would argue is designed to discipline Americans in every which way possible. And the, the, the persistent and very kind of nuanced criminalization of the ethnic Mexican community and the Central American community, such to the point where Trump can do whatever the fuck he wants to do to our community, it is uh, embodies that. So, so the question of work and labor ha has to be untangled, I think, in that kind of ongoing war that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult, it's a difficult research to do. Uh, we, you know, we were kind of very committed, we've been committed, we're still committed to, to thinking through what we're calling community safety as a way to kind of distinguish from the kind of privatized, militarized um, violence of the state mm -hmm. and around security and thinking through, you know, how, how, how is it that our community is claiming safety against these, you know, what Cedric Robinson calls street lynchings, right, the shootings that are happening. And then, of course, just the violence in, throughout Mexico, these mass graves, these disappearances, this ongoing feminicide that doesn't seem to be able to be solved. All, all of that has a purpose. This is a strategy. It, it has, it is a, the result of a strategy. So how, how to research to unravel the complexity of that level of violence and corruption and accumulation that's, that's working. That, so that, that's the, the context that labor and work ha have to be kind of managed. So I, I think, you know, that our kind of question has been, you know, kind of initially just to get out of the way where we don't want to romanticize indigenous peoples and, and our kind of relationship to indigenous communities that are uh, organized in, in around a specific kind of language but they're still able to claim that language. And also indigenous communities that have lost their language but still organized around convivial kind of structures, it, it, social infrastructure of community. Uh, we, 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 always want, we always have to engage that uh, very cautiously. Very, very, we have to tread lightly. <laughs> we have to tread, the term that I really like, that we have to tread lightly in how to learn from their ongoing struggle. What can we learn from their ongoing struggle? What tools can we, what tech 
can we transfer between our struggles? So we see CCRA as a kind of a, we're kind of a, uh, we're committed to technology transfer, where the technology is the social infrastructure of community and conviviality. And, and so I think part of the work to kind of, kind of think through labor and work, and the, the kind of the tension there, is to think through what, this, what is it that the Zapatistas have really been trying to do. So they, they completely disrupted the West's notion of war. They completely fucked it up and refused it. Right? They completely turned it on and said, that's another, that's another discussion. And they have the same with theory. Because they're, they're saying, look, we can do critique, but we had to get beyond critique. Right? Um, but what we've been trying to, what we've been really excited about is, and this isn't language that they use, but for us, we, our argument is, because we still think like this, we're still disciplined in this way, but our argument is that the, the Zapatistas are, are committed to a convivial research and search and learning. In other words, like what you were saying, what Dina was saying earlier, you know, like how to reclaim the social infrastructure of community. And that, that's a research process. That's a, that's a learning, it's an ongoing learning process. You, we, we just can't walk into a capitalist world. We can't wake up in a capitalist world and say, oh, well, fuck, we're going to just do this. It, we have to learn our way out of this, this mediation system, right? And, and so, well, what, you know, the, the, the encuentro as a, so encuentro is, it's a common word. It, you know, it means encounter. And it's, uh, the church has been using encuentros forever in Latin America, you know, since the 60s, and the preferential option of the poor, they've been using encuentro. But somehow in the Zapatista hands, it gets, it becomes politicized in a, in a, in a different way. So it, 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 we can claim it as a tool. We can claim it as a strategy. So then, the, the, but then there are all these obligations, and this is this is kind of the, the energy around cargo. A cargo is a community, collectively defined community obligation that one has to fulfill. So how, how, do, how does our mediated life around capital change when we say, well, what's my obligation to you, mm -hmm. right? If we're in a faculty, which I'll never be in again. <laughs> If we were in the faculty, we'd say, well, what's our obligation to each other? What's our obligation to these young people? Not, not you know, all the bullshit that we go through and all the shit around gray and so when I'm in a class, what, holy names, I say, look, you, everybody get a name. We're not gonna fuck around with grades. It's dispositif. You all know what dispositif means? <laughs> you know, but they, they, I know why I'm just kind of saying that. Well, they don't want to think through obligation because that, that's work, that's, that's hard work. Mm -hmm. the, the part of the work, right? in other words, to try to, to get away from labor, w what's the work to fulfill obligation and, and to think through obligation? So one thing we've been thinking about, and this is something Gustavo used to say all the time, mm -hmm. and Gustavo, kind of a mutual friend uh, of ours, and, you know, uh, you know, conspiracy, what, we had to kind of think through conspiracy. They, in, you know, he used to do this etymological kind of, kind of dance. Say, you know, in Consperetti, you share breath. You know, it's, it's precisely that. You know, in a, uh, Fred's work, you know, I've been um, rereading Fred um, just the last few days and enjoying it. And, you know, this, this kind of fugitivity and this, this common, this kind of notion of the common, you know, that, that thing that we all share that somehow gets mediated, that we, we forget that we, we're sharing that, you know? And, uh, you know, that, that's that conspiratorial moment, you know, that we, we want to share together. How, do, how is it that we can share together, right? And part, part of it, and just kind of back, it, it, part of it is, like, back in the old days, there were halls like this that you could share in, in certain, on a certain level. There was a, a certain level and in integrity around a kind of sharing. Mm -hmm. There was still somewhat mediated, but it was a gesture towards that. And I think what's exciting about being like in a space like this is it, it's quite deliberately, you know, said Robinson said consciously, right? Uh, trying to think, think through 
uh, and reclaim this building, like reclaim this space, reclaim this hall, and you know, reinvent it and take it to another level of sharing, right? Um, you know, sharing thoughts and learning together about how not to be beat down by the system is a powerful moment. That is an incredibly fucking powerful moment. And we're winning, I think. It doesn't seem like it, but we're winning. It's the, the intensity, the violence, it's become so, Aranda T. Roy said, you know, it's all about, it's not left or right, it's, it's fascism against non-fascism, because, and that's, that's that democratic despotic moment that articulates around fascism in, in, uh, in the 20th century, that's how it articulated. And, you know, that's that, you know, that, that, in, that intensity. So, you know, what we're trying to think through is, well, what, what exactly do we mean by the social infrastructure of community as a kind of, like, I, we don't have a language, like an, an exercise of conviviality or an embodiment of conviviality that is that organized around these tools, these convivial tools, like the assembly, where the assembly functions to determine obligation, right? And then we're thinking, well, then that, but that has to be a conspiracy that, you know, and not, not just a conspiracy, you know, a clandestine one, but one that is open, that is not afraid to be open and say we can conspire together to do something. So one last, one last point. It, it, so what we're also kind of struggling with is that then, and this is why I was kind of blathering on about critique, is that, well, then that's not necessarily a theorization for us. It, it's something else. Right? Because then we don't want to get caught when we're conspiring, de debating what Marx we should have read or how we should have read Marx. Not that that's not that that's not enjoyable because I love doing that. <laughs> so don't get me wrong. Um, but but it it has to be about the tool that we already have. So when we talk about convivial research, we, so like we're always thinking, well, what's the tool that's already present? that we maybe haven't fully embraced, or we're starting to abandon, or that is being attacked and whittled away at, that we, we're, we're leaving it in a way. What's that tool? So like when we're thinking about militarized police violence here in, in the Bay, for us the tool was clearly safety, because the community was getting together and saying, no, we're, we're exhausted, we can't keep going one shooting at a time, right? It's devastating the community and the, the fabric of the community is completely over, overwhelmed. And we're not fully making visible this, this state strategy here. What exactly is happening with the state strategy? And a lot of pieces were missing. And then, of course, the nonprofit came in and tried to privatize that and kind of commandeer that, that movement. And uh, anyway, it's like, you know, that. yeah. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about work and labor still, and, and I'm wondering now, um, so it's coming together in my mind, it's work and, and tools. Um, it, it, and even to, to think about safety as a tool, which is to say, a certain kind of concept as a tool, but also a practice. If if that that, that safety is a is a common is a practice that we share. I mean, maybe it is the practice of sharing, right? That there is no safety out without without sharing. Um, but so that this 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 rich kind of deep interplay between between practice and work and tool, or even, let's say, instrument being, it makes me, so there's several things that I'm, this has just been running through my head the last, again, the last month. Another big part of going to the, to Columbia was not only being able to meet all these various groups of people who are involved in, in trying to fight and to survive this sort of genocidal paramilitarism, but also 
somehow that was constantly being filtered through or entangled with meeting people who's, who had, in some sense, built their lives around the study and practice of percussion. <laughs> and it was, again, it's like that thing where it's not that I met, it's not that I hadn't always thought that the music, um, I had always thought that the music had something to do with liberation, but it just got, it got, it got, it got reinforced on this trip in, in a, because it was made both unfamiliar and it was both unfamiliar and totally familiar at the same time. Okay. So, um, so why am I thinking this? Because I'm thinking of this man that I met who was a great, who is a great musician and a great maker of musical instruments, and in, partic in particular, the, the, the marimba. And his name is, um, and you have to excuse my horrible Spanish, but Rodilio Cuamo. And, okay, so this has seemed like a sharp detour, but it's really not. Do y'all know, um, you know, Amiri Baraka, great poet, he has this set of poems called Wise. Um, and it's spelled two different ways, W-H-Y-S, but also W-I-S-E. And in one of these poems, the first one I think of the series, he's sort of saying, kind of talking about the middle passage basically, and what happens when you find yourself in the dark on your back on the ship, you're in trouble. He said, and he says, what happens when you find, when you, when they take your oom um, boom boom boom? When they take your oom um, boom boom boom, then you're in deep trouble. It might take you 400 years to get out. He's talking about this on a double sense, the, the taking of, of, of African percussion, which was a tool for communication, but also a, a tool of communicability. It was a, it was a, a, a technium, right? It was a, and so um, one way to think about what Don Bedilio is doing is trying to, 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 not to take it back, but to, 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 to be in this constant process of the reclamation of percussion as, as, a, as a modality of sharing. And, of, and, and what I guess, the reason why I'm going off on this tangent is because when they took away the boom, 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 boom on the shores of what we now call the United States, like the laws outlawing drums in South Carolina in the 1730s, for instance, when they did that, what, what folks did was they just turned their bodies into instruments, right? That's out of, out of, it is out of that sort of criminalization of percussion that Hambone and Juba emerged, right? It's, you know, that, okay. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful moment of something like what you might call the, becoming an instrument in a way that has certain kinds of Christian resonances. You know, Lord, I just want to be your instrument. I, I want to be a vessel, right? That, that kind of thing. We become instruments for one another. This is part of the work, okay? Um, and the space or the, the movement or the practice within which that becoming instrument is both enacted and also protected, that's part of what I think is meant not just by me, but by the folks who really, well, the main person, to my mind, who I took up the term fugitivity from, Nathaniel Mackey. That's what I think he meant, you know, this, this, this movement and practice of sharing that under duress, um, which is both a movement out of it's always directed out of the world within which this duress is carried out. But it is also a movement within that world, right? Um, two, it's always both. There, there's, a, there's a 
flight from and at the same time also flight within. And that flight is also always fighting. It's not in opposition to, it's not flight or fight, it's flight and fight. Right? Um, and, and it is, and it's material. It, it's sensual. Um, that notion of conspiracy, to breathe with, to share breath, it reminds me of, uh, it reminds me of this, well, to, you know, to me at least, you know, the sort of great, you know, Afro-American novel is, is, is Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston. And if you remember at the very beginning of the book, as she's re-entering her community in Eatonville, Janie goes up to her house and then meets her, her friend Phoebe, brings her some food, and Phoebe's telling her that all the folks are sitting on their porches wondering what happened to Janie, and wondering what Janie said. Janie said, I ain't thinking about them people. I don't care to tell them my story, but I'll tell you, Phoebe, and if you want to tell them, you can. Because she says, because my, my tongue is in my friend's mouth. So here, this breathing together, at the same time also as this speaking together. And, and what she's telling is a story of fugitivity. The story of what she calls life in the muck, <laughs> right? With tea cake and it's... People want to talk about it as if it were a love story or a kind of down home Harlequin romance kind of thing, but it, it ain't so much about Jeannie's relation to tea cake, it's about both their relations to the month, both their relations to a certain kind of sociality of work, right, that, that they engaged in together with other people. And, um, and it's about the ways in which that kind of sociality is always under duress. Um, and, and some of the duress that it's under is not just, is what you might call like theoretical duress. <laughs> the, not, it's not theoretical because it only exists in theory. It's theoretical because it is in some ways produced by way of the deployment of theory. Um, so part of the reason I'm so excited about the difference between work and labor is because it lets me know that the, the irony, one of the ironies of Marx is, is he makes a he makes he makes a crucial theoretical distinction between labor and labor power. But the way he makes that distinction is by recognizing that capital had already made that distinction, right? Capital was like, look, capital wants to abstract from the body of the labor. Don't want to have to be responsible for it. It's why wage slavery is a ratcheting up of the violence of slavery, okay, right? Because now I don't have to be responsible for your body. You have to be responsible for your body, right? I gave, matter of fact, you have to be responsible for the individual body that I imposed upon you by violence, right? And what, but this distinction between, and so we say, okay, yes, let me see now if I can go about the business of becoming responsible for this body that you have imposed upon me. Right. Okay, let me stop for a second. To, is it clear what I mean when I say the body that has been imposed upon me? Can I stop for two minutes and explain what I mean by, I just want to make sure, okay. So for many, many years, among other folks, obviously people we mentioned, Cedric Robinson, you know, uh, you know, Nam Chandler, whoever, Marx, but two of the people whose work has always been sort of guiding, that I've always, what's the word I'm trying to, like I'm trying to follow behind them, you know how little kids sometimes, you know, will follow behind you in the garden and 
you know, pick up shit, you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, trying to help, you know what I'm saying? Trying to help, like baby help. You, you ever get, <laughs> y'all ever get baby help, you know? And you'd be like, come on, you know, it, it makes the job longer and shit, you know, everything. <laughs> but they're trying to learn how to work. As my grand, man, there's so much shit running through my head, man. Like my mother sent me to Arkansas when I was 12 for the summer because my grandfather said it was time for him to teach me how to work. And that's what I did. I followed behind him and on his truck farm in Kingsland, Arkansas, and I was trying to pick, you know, picking, picking purple hole peas. And, you know, and, and I, I messed up a lot of peas picking them too soon, you know. I, I, I ruined a lot of tomatoes picking them too soon, you know. You know but by the end of the summer, I, could, I was at least, you know what I'm saying. So, so my relation to my grandfather is somewhat like my relation to, to, to Hortense Spillers and Saidiya Hart. Um, you know, they're they trying to show me how to work, and I'm following behind them. And, and this is one of those instances where I'm following behind them, okay? So they're like, you know, Spillers, you know, there's a version of what Spillers says that became popular a few years ago, written by, you know, this ta Coates, you know, what's the, the, between the world and me. He talks about black life as being, in some ways, determined by what he calls the theft of the body. Well, Hortense Spillers says in 1987, okay. And he doesn't really cite her, but he probably just forgot. Sometimes that shit happens. Sometimes you don't know where stuff comes from, and it doesn't mean I'm serious. You, you can't always be responsible for who, for what you heard, you know. It doesn't matter. What matters is that it helped to revive this idea, okay? And he's saying, yeah, you know, she's saying that part of what the experience of slavery was was that you were, you were, you had a body you, 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 you experience it as the theft of a body. What, what does it mean to have a body? First of all, it means that you can have. The condition of being a slave is you couldn't have anything. You couldn't even have yourself, right? You could have a baby, but you couldn't have the baby. It wasn't yours. It belonged to the master. You understand? This was this condition, right? You couldn't protect yourself. Um, Spiller says you, it meant that you were, you were absolutely available in the flesh to slave masters. And, and this availability is part of it, is an availability that operates within the general framework, okay, of paramilitarism, of that, of, of policing. It's like they can just come in your house. They can just grab you out the car, right? You, you, you just, they, as she said, you, they can pluck your nappy head from wherever you are. Okay. They can just come get you. And you can't protect yourself, right? And when you can't protect yourself, that basically means you don't have a self to protect. The body is the sort of conceptual slash physical ground of this capacity for self-protection for self-protection, for self-location, right? For self-identification, right? The body is the seat of that, okay? So, to live without a body, to live in the aftermath of the theft of body, that's brutal, right? It's experienced primarily as, as torture. But what I think is implicit in what Spillers is saying and I think this is made more explicit when you read Saidiya Hartman as a reader of Spillers, is that this theft of body is always accompanied by an equally horrific, brutal mode of violation, which is the imposition of the idea of the necessity of an individual body in the first goddamn place. Because that's the condition of possibility of this sort of normalization of brutal individuation. I, used to, I saw this with, 
when my kids were like in, in nursery school, you know, like in daycare, and, and, the, and the people, who they, the, the women who ran the daycare were beautiful, lovely people, they felt that it was absolutely necessary to make sure that my kids early on knew this is your body. You know, you see what I'm saying? They were kind of constantly trying to make sure that the kids knew that their bodies belonged to them as a way of building them up to protect themselves from possible violation, right? But what it really did was it interdicted a kind of discipline on those kids. Because you know how little kids are, when they see each other, they just want to hug each other. Right? They're constantly crawling all over you and crawling all over themselves, right? It was, it was the beginning of a regulation of this very specific kind of haptic sociality that kids are doing. It was just the beginning of this, don't invade my space, right? That's mine. You see what I mean? It was the beginning of the enforcement of a regime of private property where the first modality of private property is your body. And that's a brutal violence too, okay? That's, it's the, it's the conceptual ground of what this great, you know, historian of thought, George McPherson called possessive individualism, which is the fundamental crucial idea for capitalism. So do you see what I'm trying to say? What, 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 what black folks, what indigenous folks, what women, in this 500 year era of conquest have had to deal with is this double violation. The theft of body and the imposition of the body. They go together. Okay. So, what I guess I'm trying to say is this distinction between work, so we say labor, the distinction between labor and labor power says that in the wake of slavery, in the so-called aftermath of it, which is itself a kind of myth, right? The difference between wage labor and slave labor is, is that the enslaved, the, the formerly enslaved person now has to take responsibility for their own body. Under conditions that are structured in such a way that they could never properly take responsibility for their own body. Right? We'll pay you shit, nothing. But you know what? I don't have to take care of your body anymore. You do. And guess what? You know, all you have to do is continue to produce bodies so that you, thereby rendering your own body absolutely and imminently replaceable. So, there's a part of the process of liberation that we become involved in in which we say, okay, let me now figure out how to take responsibility for and to protect my own body, to protect my own individual life, or to say that our individual lives matter. When those individual lives have been subdivided out of, you know, a sort of general notion of community. And all I'm trying to suggest is, is that this distinction that Manolo is making between work and labor allows us to take a further step beyond that essentially liberal, okay, reaction. Okay. It's not that it's a bad reaction. It's not that it's not a justified reaction. Yes, let me protect my body. Let us protect our bodies. But a further thought is required. And that further thought, I think, is given to us by way of this distinction between work and labor. Because to use Spillers' words, if labor is the province of the body, maybe work is the province of the flesh. Which is to say, of our animated flesh, our conspiratorial flesh, our, the flesh we have that breathes together. Right? And that isn't structured by the sharp and brutal individuation, okay, of our community into infinite but uncollectible sets of individual bodies. We're not individual bodies, right? You know, 
when, when you, some of y'all have kids, so y'all know what I mean. That's just the easiest way. It's like, no man, that's, that's not, it's my body. No, no, that's not your body. When you hurt your body, it hurts me. Okay? Which means that the simple bullshit metaphysics that we all seem to be operating under, which says that that's your body and this is mine, I know that shit ain't actually true. Like, our lived experience is continually, t when, so when something hurts you and it actually hurts me, why would I deny the truth of that experience? Okay. So, it seems to me that work gets us back to that. And, and it doesn't mean that this is, and, and this is what's deep about it, right? The work gets us to that. Y'all all right? Okay. Okay. That hurt. That hurt me. <laughs> um, seriously. Okay. But um, we, we, why would we accept that? You know, work. Work isn't work isn't just work is 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 is, the, is both the, the thought work and the study, but also as you say the protocols and the practices the, the the cargo that allows us to maintain this this flesh, right? And 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 to and as you say to to protect it. it so I'm not talking about like that silly goopy romantic Tom. Y'all understand? It's not that. The love is not that. It's, it's the love you got to work for. You have to work for it. It's not naturalized as some condition that maintains itself even though you don't do no work for it. Um, so I'm just agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, listen. <laughs> I listen to this. But uh, what... One thing that I just kept thinking about in terms of like also thinking back to the to the drumming and, and dance, which is always good drumming, right? Because you know when we when we start out just before the Zapatistas group of us thinking through, you know, like what I guess technically we're calling network pedagogy, but the idea was to you know to 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 manage how we were um, being um, disciplined at, into the university system, right? So we, the way we talked about it at the time is we wanted to anticipate our own diaspora, meaning that after graduate school, we would go off and all, since, you know, I'm very light skinned, but all of us were folks, young, young people of color, and, and the idea was we did, you know, we didn't want to just be the token minority. We wanted to try to remain a collective and to, from our own kind of collect, collectivity, manage how we were all navigating uh, different faculties as we were joining faculty. So we, we would still technically be together, but dispersed. And um, it didn't work, unfortunately, because we couldn't share uh, the work, but we, meaning we couldn't share the distribution, the dis distribution of the little crumbs we got. We were refused to share it. But uh, that's another story. But, but our strategy at the time was to think through uh, connecting different spaces. So we had the bar seminar, um, and we, we imagine the bar seminar as an extension of the seminar, that we were also trying to control that seminar, so we weren't just there consuming. And then we had also whatever other kinds of learning spaces, like these kinds of spaces that we would, in workshop spaces that we would convene. And then to kind of, um, then we would have direct actions, and then there, uh, imagine all of those as kind of ongoing learning moments. But what we imagined that tied it all together for us was the mitote. And mitote was a word that the Spanish used to criminalize indigenous peoples who were organizing uh, clandestinely. And so the idea for us was to reclaim that word, and, but, but also to reclaim that practice and to have, basically the kind of long story short was we, we, we would we'd try to politicize the house party. So the idea was <laughs> we'd take the house party, so we'd be at the bar seminar, and we'd be there till 10, 11, and then we'd go to the house party. And in that, but we insisted that the house party, um, you know, continue the energy and the learning, but it had to be a space of, of learning. 
So we had to you know, organize some knowledge that we were sharing in some particular way. But, but the idea of the mitote was also that it was, uh, what we kind of playfully said, it was a clandestine ritualized uh, celebration and dance and intergenerational sharing, right? House party. I mean, you know, Cristiano would be drinking hard and dancing and music, and, but, but we would break and talk about shit. Not, not talk, like, you know, but with, like, somebody would, you know, say something that needed to be discussed, and then we'd keep partying and dancing. And then, of course, all things happen around that kind of space. But, you know, anyway, but, you know, what, listening to you, uh, you know, that made sense and it worked very well and, and as this part of the strategy. And one of the arguments that we were making at the time was that, uh, and I think, you know, think about it in terms of kind of even the working class, the U.S. working class, that you know, capital destroyed the working class bar to, to control workers. It, you know, so our argument was that we, you know, we need that space to let, to reclaim our bodies, right? And that's what I was thinking, like, how do you reclaim your body so it's not, you know, the system's body anymore? It's, it's back to your body. Sometimes that looks like to some people like you're destroying your body, but you're you're reclaiming it. You're in your body through dance and through whatever else happens. And you know, drink helps. You know, there are kinds of party favors help. And you know, that's what it is. That, but that to me, it's always been a reclaiming. And I, I say that also. Um, you know, the Sabbatistas always have a dance after. And of course, they do that. There's no alcohol and no drugs in the Sabbatista communities. Uh, which is also fine. I prefer it the other way, but uh, but I, I'm also saying that I, I I can't I don't I can't trace it out exactly. But I think we're at a stage of capital that is a frightening stage of capital. It, it's also very exciting because capital is ending. We can talk about that. But cap capital no longer it, it's gonna, it can't reproduce itself. Nor can what it's doing. Nor can the environment sustain what it's doing. So it's frightening and exciting. But 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 capital is really going after the body in a vicious way. And we're so afraid to be together. It seems to be, maybe because I'm old, maybe I'm out of things now, but it seems it seems that we're increasingly more afraid to be around each other. I mean it's COVID-19. My God. It's going to destroy capital. COVID-19, this virus is exposing how fucked up capital, yeah. how capital can't reproduce itself anymore. But it, what's also frightening is people are afraid of each other. And that's, that's scary. That's, that is, right? Not that people weren't already afraid of each other, because that's what race does, but in general. But it's taken another level. So they go, it's militarized in a way. It's astonishing. And you know, I wonder about that. I, I, I worry. I worry about. I worry about that. Right? That, you know, when we're reclaiming work and trying to imagine, you know, where we're beyond this system, where we work again. Right? I mean, because that's exactly what the Zapatistas did. The Escuelita was organized such that the I don't know, was it three thousand visitors? I can't remember. Everybody went to a community and did exactly what you did to follow along people who were working. And that was, that was the pedagogy. There was no, with the exception of the one group of folks who stayed at Universidad de la Tierra there in San Cris, which was all the intellectuals and the old men, which is where I was. <laughs> but other than that, if you were in the community, you were, you were following along, watching how people pick coffee, how people you know, clean, and how you, know, you make food in a, over an open fire. You know? yeah. In, in a compact dirt floor, and what, what the world is about. Anyway, I also mention that because, you know, it, I think you know one of the one of the kind of complexities around conviviality and the you know question of reclaiming work and like the social infrastructure of community and re reclaiming these tools is that we're so far from. We're so far from, in many ways it feels at times, we're so far from the Escolita, 
you know, we're so far from these communities, where these communities, like in Colombia, like you're saying, in Brazil, the level of paramilitary violence in, in narco violence, which is the state in capital, that is, it's just at a level that is, it's, I don't know the sense of the language for it, it's astonishing. How, how do we in the game, and, and you know, the U.S. is responsible. I mean, what do we do? I, I mean, I, I say that, I think we know what to do, but to make that step, to, to reclaim work is part of that step, right? It's, it's, it's also part of, partly confronting that violence. Like what we do, we were doing this, uh, we put, put together this one tool, community safety um, database. And the idea of the community safety database, is a lot, a lot to say about it, but part of it was to, how, how do we con construct a space, a space, you know, like a social infrastructure to, to be with mothers who have lost, who've lost a son or, or a daughter or a child? How, how do we be, or, or, you know, brother or sister, but how do we be with family members who, who suffered that, the loss of that kind of state violence mm -hmm. and state manufactured violence, right? How, how do we, you know, walk with that? And what, what do we do? Uh, and how do we continue to learn, like learn from them? Because if, we all know this, everybody here knows this, it, they're, they're incredibly well organized and they're, all, they're, the, they're the first responders and they don't let go. Um, so there's a lot to do there. There's a lot, you know, to learn from and a lot to engage. And, you know, and I, you know, how do we do that? And, and that's also part of that work, right? Is just like just to follow along, mm -hmm. you know, following along, and and you know, they're managing all this intense level of crisis mm -hmm. with, within this extent, extended family and community that gets really complex. You know, mm -hmm. so just how to manage all that is really difficult. Anyway, that's partly what we've also been thinking about in terms of like the, the conviviality. Where there, there's a tool, there's a there's a tool there that is not always so visible to us. And then you know, but then and this is the point I really want to make is, but it it's naive not to say that there's also not a distance. There. Yeah. It's right. It's funny because well, the other person I met, I met. Don Bobilio in uh, in uh, Buenaventura, Colombia, and then the other person that I, but I didn't meet him because they killed him. A man named uh, Temistocles Machado, who was a kind of leader of a group, um, the, the translation in English of the name of the group is the Black Communities Process in, in Buenaventura. He was engaged in something like a community database, an archive he had built that included not only the history of folks' inhabitation in this sort of unchartered, you know, sort of non-individually owned land that they share outside of the framework of the state, but also the history of how that land then got stolen. And the way, of course, that it was stolen was that it was first trans planted or transmuted into private property so that it could then be stolen. And, but the paramilitaries killed him. So who I met was his widow and his son and the other people who, with whom he had been engaged in essentially convivial research, which then was the groundwork that made it possible for them to engage in what they call a civil strike or what we would call a general strike that effectively shut, gummed up, and if not shut down, import, export capital, not only in Colombia, but they, they backed the Panama Canal up just by virtue of taking control of a bridge that went from the port, because Buena Ventura is a port city inland, and that was the primary logistical sort of, you know, uh, artery, okay, that, that allowed goods to be imported, you know, in, into, the, into, the, into the state. 
And then I was sitting, you know, on the picket line with the graduate student workers at UC Santa Cruz Wednesday and who were trying in their own way to, to gum up the logistics of the UC system, which is really primarily around the circulation of grades. And they were engaged in their own forms of community, you know, uh, convivial research there. And what, I mean, I'm lucky enough to, to I, you know, I guess to be in both places and at the same time not living under that immediate kind of duress that they both were living under in different ways. Um, certainly the police force was brought in to, to harass and to arrest some of the students there, but, but the paramilitary force that operated in there in the way that they was also that, which is to say the intensity of the relationship between paramilitarism and capital, right? Just the, um, the, the way it manifests itself in their lives is that they, they don't make enough money to live, to eat, to study. They, you can't do work, you know? You can't, you, can't, you can't get any work done when the median, you know, rent in the city that you're supposed to live in is $2,472 or something and your paycheck is $2,430. It's bullshit, okay? So, you know, um, you know being, being underpaid is a form of policing too. So, so there's that part of it. But what links them, not me, but what linked them is that they both told me to tell y'all. <laughs> right? So, so here's the thing. And what did they, did, did they want to spread the strike. They want to spread the general strike. Okay. Now the thing is, is that what the folks in Buenaventura, Colombia had is something that the student workers in Santa Cruz were trying to build. And it's something that we have to join them. Our conviviality with them is a function of our being able to build something like this too, which is to say, we can't, con we can't be in solidarity with them if we're not in solidarity with ourselves, right? Like, like so, that, so that this, you can't confront the enemy if you have not developed these habits of assembly. You can be confronted by them, you know, but you have to have, this is the, it's other, in other words, it's how do you build, what's the condition of possibility of our resistance? And it is this conviviality, and it's these practices. And um, so it's like, yeah, I can, I can articulate my solidarity with those folks, but it doesn't mean shit if I haven't, begun to consider and to study how to transform the habits of the conditions within which I deal with the people that I deal with every day. And, um, and that's something that, uh, you know, we're not, I, I, I have to figure out a different way, you know, to, for lack of a better word, teach my classes. You know, it's like, you were, t again, talking about safety as a tool. The, the, when you teach, you know, every, every semester you get this really great gift, you know, basically. It's kind of, although they're desperately trying to take it away from us, which is a whole bunch of people come and say, basically, I'm here to hang out with you for the next 14 weeks while we think about some shit together. And we squander that. We squander it all the time in, in search of something else that we think might be better or something, I don't know. Um, but we squander it. And we have to stop squandering that. I mean, 
I, when I say we, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying this. I'm talking to my, I don't know. I'm just talking to myself out loud. I mean, to, for those of us who teach, maybe. But, and that's just one place. That's, that's where I work. Okay, or that's where, <laughs> that's, that's where I provide labor, you know. If I want it to be a place where I work, then that's, then I gotta, we gotta work on that, you know. Um, I, I mean, I, I squander it, I do. Let me, let me admit to everybody here, <laughs> I squander it, and, and, I, and I, it bothers me. But, you know, I, I mean, at the same time, I also feel like I'm, we're confronted by a lot of young people who come in and say, I, I want that degree, and I want, and I was promised an experience here. Mm -hmm. You know, I was promised a package yeah. that I was going to get a degree and I was going to have this good time, mm -hmm. right? And this is what was, that's what the catalog, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what they, all the recruiters said. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, they're mostly kids of color and they, well, why did I get abandoned when I got here? Mm -hmm. So then, so they get a little pissed off, yeah. right? <laughs> and then I'm out there spewing all this shit like, hey, you know, we got, this is an interesting time, right? Capital is ending, right? Environment, and what the fuck is this guy talking about? Mm -hmm. Right? And then I don't know what to do. Right? I mean, I, you know, because, yeah, I, I want to talk about work and labor. Yeah. I want to talk about conviviality. I'm like, let's, let's hang out. I want to hang out. Yeah. And I'm like, what the fuck is this guy still doing here? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the administration says, well, you know, hey, what the hell's going on in there? Right? You got an attendance problem. I said, no, I don't have a attendance problem. You have an attendance problem. You know? Sorry, sorry. I, 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 thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just being conscious of the time. It's, it's been about an hour and a half, and so we we can either open it up to questions. We can talk a little bit more. I just want to gauge how you're feeling and how the audience is feeling right now. Um, Saint Clair Shakes, who's here, has is a um, Oakland-based activist and food activist and nutritionist, and she's prepared prepared this excellent console for us to share. Um, so we can, how do you feel, Craig? Oh, I, I know everybody probably hungry and wants to, wants to, is, y'all must want to talk to, we, I, we just lost track of time, we're so. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel, yeah. do you want questions, what are, chat people? Yeah, yeah, Yes. <laughs> I agree. And a minimum income is paid for your general strike. Well, I don't know if I agree with that, but, but I agree with the first one. Which is to say, yeah, there's no analysis of slavery that can dispense with an analysis of patriarchy, at least. That's what I hear you saying. Um, so I think that's absolutely true. Any other questions? All right, do you ask questions amongst yourselves? <laughs> Thank you so much, Brandon.